The Decline and Fall of the American Empire, authored by Doug Casey via International Man. And this is by Zero Hedge, Tyler Durden. Doug Casey, International Man. And we have here a statue of Romulus and Remus feeding from the wolf. But before continuing, please seat yourself comfortably. This article will necessarily cover exactly those things we're never supposed to talk about, religion and politics, and do what you're never supposed to do, namely uh, badmouth certain things. There are good reasons for looking to Rome rather than any other civilization when trying to see where the U.S. is headed. It's uh, because history, as we know, repeats itself. We should take lessons from history. Everyone knows Rome declined, but few people understand why. And I think even fewer realize that the U.S. is now well along the same path for pretty much the same reasons. And I'll explore shortly, he says. Rome reaches peak of military power around the year 107, when Trajan completed the conquest of Dacia, a territory of modern Romania. With Dacia, the empire peaked in size, but I'd argue it was already past its peak by almost every other measure. The U.S. reaches peak relative to the world in the same ways, its absolute peak, as early as the 1950s, in 1950, this country produced 50% of the world's GNP and 80% of its vehicles. Now it's about 21% of the world's GNP and 5% of its vehicles. It owned two-thirds of the world's gold reserves, now it holds one-fourth. It was, by a huge margin, the world's biggest creditor, whereas now it's the biggest debtor by a huge margin. The income of the average American was by far the highest in the world, Today it ranks about 8th, and it's slipping. But it's not just the U.S., it's Western civilization that is in decline. In 1910, Europe controlled almost the whole world, politically, financially, and militarily. Now it's becoming a Disneyland with real buildings and a petting zoo for the Chinese. It's even further down the slippery slope than the U.S. Like America, Rome was founded by refugees from Troy, at least in myth. Like America, it was ruled by kings in its early history. Later, Romans became self-governing with several assemblies and a senate. And later still, power devolved to the executive, which was likely not an accident. U.S. founders modeled the country on Rome, all the way down to the architecture of government buildings, the use of the eagle as a national bird, the use of Latin mottos, and the unfortunate use of the faces the axe uh, surrounded by rods as a symbol of state power. Publius, the pseudonym author of the Federalist Papers, took his name from one of Rome's first councils. As it was in Rome, military prowess is at the center of the national identity of the U.S. When you adopt a model in earnest, you grow to resemble it. A considerable cottage industry has developed comparing ancient and modern times since Edward Gibbon published The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire in 1776, the same year as Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations and the U.S. Declaration of Independence were written. I'm a big fan of all three, but DNF is not only a great history, it's a very elegant and readable literature, and it's actually a, la a laugh riot. Gibbon had a subtle wit. There have been huge advances in our understanding of Rome since Gibbon's time, Driven by archaeological discoveries, there were many things he just didn't know because he was as much a philologist as a historian, and he based his writing on what the ancients said about themselves. There was no real science of archaeology when Gibbon wrote. Little had been done even to correlate the surviving ancient texts with what was on the surviving monuments, even the well-known monuments and on the coins, not to mention scientists digging around in the provinces of what was left of Roman villas, battle sites, and that sort of thing. So Gibbon, like most historians, was to a degree a collector of hearsay. And how could he know whom to believe among the ancient sources? It's as though William F. Buckley, Gore Vidal, and H. L. Mencken, Norman Mailer, and George Carlin all wrote about the same event, and you were left to figure out whose story was true. That would make it tough to tell what really happened just a few years ago. Forget about ancient history. 
That's why the study of history is so tendacious. So much of it is he said, she said. In any event, perhaps you don't want a lecture on ancient history. You'd probably be more entertained by some guesses about what's likely to happen to the U.S., and I've got some. Let me start by saying that I'm not sure the collapse of Rome was not a good thing. There was many positive aspects to Rome, as there are to most civilizations, but there was much else to Rome which I disprove, such as its anti-commercialism, its militarism, and post-Caesar, its centralized and increasingly totalitarian government. In that light, it's worth considering whether the collapse of the U.S. might not be a good thing. So why did Rome fall? In 1985, a German named Demant assembled 210 reasons. I find some of them silly, like racial de de degeneration, homosexuality, and excessive freedom. Most are redundant. Some are just common sense, like bankruptcy, loss of moral fiber, and corruption. And you could read more here on the link. I'll leave a link below for you. This is um, on Zero Hedge by Doug Casey via International Man. Please leave your comments. Thank you for your support. Kindly support my Patreon account. The daily posts are five videos daily, and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box below.